Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, that you have included us in your plan. And Father, I pray now that you would open our hearts and minds to the word that you have for us. Pray that you would speak through me, Lord Jesus, and give me that word. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Well, so it's uh, wonderful to see you all here. Um, I want to thank you for prayers for Amanda. She is doing wonderfully. Um, you know, she can't use her right arm a whole lot, but um, it is healing nicely, and she's figuring out new ways to do lots of things around the house. So, <laughs> but she won't be driving for a while, so um, it's okay. It's a nice break, right? No, she says, no, it's not a nice break. <laughs> but thank you all for your prayers. She is doing well. For those of you who don't know, she broke her right collarbone, but it, she had surgery and it's healing nicely. So um, I enjoyed doing the research for the scriptures today. And um, it's, it's fun, you know, as you prepare for a sermon, you wind up doing quite a bit of reading and researching on things. And I commend it to you at some point. You know, you can go to nice websites, one of the ones I use, literaryible.org, and it does have a good group of reference material there as well as multiple versions of the scripture. And so you can always just pick a, a passage that you like or want to research more on, and you can go on to lots of things. Now, there are a lot of things that as we go through preparing a sermon that I have to throw out. And, um, you know, that's okay. So you kind of have to condense it down to what actually might be appropriate. So that's um, kind of where we are. Anyway, that's just an aside, really. Uh, for some reason, the Lord had me think about masks. <laughs> and I don't know why that is. We certainly had to deal with masks quite a bit, haven't we? But you know, there are other masks too. Superheroes wear masks, right? And so like Batman and uh, the Flash and um, some of those others, Captain America, they wear masks and they wear them to um, uh, conceal their identity so that they can continue to do their work. So, you know, then again, there are lots of other masks and we're coming up to this time now where, you know, we think of Halloween and all of that. People will be wearing lots of different masks for that. Um, if you go down to Central or South America, they'll be wearing masks as well coming up around November 1st and 2nd. The uh, Dia de los Fueles Defuntos, which is Day of the Faithful Departed, or um, the Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead. But anyway, masks are involved there. Masks are used all over the world, as a matter of fact. Uh, Chinese masks, we can think of Egyptian masks, we can think of... Um, you know, all sorts you can think uh, over the years, South American masks, Incan, uh, Mayan, all that sort of thing. And of course, now we're all wearing masks a lot too, because we have to cover up this thing called COVID. Um, and certainly it can help prevent spread and it can help prevent you from contracting it. So, but to see the thing, the whole reason that I got started on this is because in my version of the NIV, 1 Thessalonians 2, um, verse 5 translates this way. It says, you know we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness, it says. And <laughs> that's the only place, actually, that translates that way. Um, and I see Father Bill is looking up his version right now, <laughs> so we can see what it comes up with. But it just kind of struck me right now, you know, here we are all wearing masks, and Paul says, we did not put on a mask to cover up greed. So I decided to look into that a little bit more. And actually, if you just look at other versions, none of the other versions translate it that way. So if you have one of the others, for instance, New King James says, for neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Yeah, so, okay, now we start to understand a little bit more, because I was trying to think, why would Paul say that? And honestly, why did he say, you know, we did not put on a mask? I don't think he did, honestly. <laughs> and, and if we, you know, want to make it even a little clearer, okay, like I said, from NIV, I said, you know, we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. If you go to this New Living Translation, it says, never once do we try to win you with flattery, as you well know, 
and God is our witness, and we are not pretending to be your friends just to get your money. So that kind of makes some sense. So uh, anyway, that's just kind of a little aside. If you look at different versions of the scripture, it's always a good idea to do that because you can kind of start to see a better understanding of it. King James is always great as well, too. You can go back to Greek versions as well. So once again, I commend that research to you. But you know what? We're moving on from there now. That's just one of those little fun aside things, okay? The actual place that we're going to be going, if you want to turn in your Bibles, you can go to Matthew chapter 22, the gospel for today that you heard starting around, oh, verse 42, something like that. Um, now, the first part of that is should be very familiar to you because you heard the first and greatest commandment and the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, you hear that every week, okay? You heard it at the beginning of the service today. It is key and so important in our uh, faith, in our understanding of God and Jesus, okay? Now, just to kind of give a little bit of background on this, Jesus had been sparring with the Sadducees. That was last week. You and um, he uh, answered their question about um, marriage and divorce and what happens in heaven. And they were basically confounded and they could not answer, ask him any more questions. So they just went silent. Okay. And that's why it says he silenced the Sadducees. Do you see what I mean? They were basically like, um, okay. We'll go away now. So that's what happened. And so the Pharisees found out about this. Of course, they were already around, but they started asking him questions and they said, ha ha, we're going to get this guy because we are Pharisees. We know the most about scripture and the law of anybody in Israel. So they come to him once again. And as you recall, you know, over these last several weeks, We've been uh, hearing the uh, different um, sparring events that Jesus had with the Pharisees and Sadducees and teachers of the law, um, you know, all through these last several weeks in uh, the book of Matthew. So, um, once again, we come to uh, this story, which, uh, unlike one that I talked to you about before in some of the parables, does occur in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, okay? This one uh, is there in every version. Um, now, it varies a little bit in the way that it's uh, told. Here in Matthew, of course, we have Jesus answering them correctly, and then he goes on to ask a similar question, and that question he asks is, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? They replied, well, he is the son of David. Jesus responded, well, then why does David, speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit, call the Messiah my Lord? For David said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies beneath your feet. Since David called the Messiah my Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? Now, that was the trick question. It confounded them. They could not answer this. Uh, they, so they finally stopped examining him. They finally stopped trying to ask him any questions or, more importantly, to trip him up and get him to say something incorrectly or blasphemous. And it's not because they didn't stop, you see, because they're now believers. Oh, we believe. Yeah, no, it wasn't that. It was because they were embarrassed and they couldn't answer his question. And so they were silenced as well, okay? So we finally come to that place. He gave the ultimate um, question that they couldn't answer, and that was it. Now, this scripture, as I said, is important. And um, if you go back and look at it, it shows up in uh, all three uh, synoptic gospels. In Mark chapter 12, you know, one of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate, and he realized that Jesus had answered it well, so he asked of all the commandments, which is the most important? And again, Jesus answers with the Shema, the thing that you heard at the beginning of service, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, uh, Hero Israel, Lord your God, the Lord is one, 
and then love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Now, um, in Mark chapter 12, um, it says, well, I was just telling you that, and I just read it to you. What do you know? Uh, the teacher responded well. He answered expertly, and everyone thought it was the best answer. And so then Jesus told him he wasn't far from the kingdom of God. Now, they thought he had nailed that question. He was like, man, you are right on. You have got it going on. Jesus tells him he isn't far from the kingdom of God. <laughs> In other words, you're not there yet, okay? You're not there yet, buddy. So they stopped asking him questions. <laughs> now, in Luke, it uh, goes at Luke chapter 10. He says, one day, an expert in the religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus asks him a question back. Well, how do you read it? So that guy tells him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Second is love your neighbor as yourself. And so the expert in this case answered the commandment. He answered it correctly. And then in the Luke's version, it leads into the parable of the Good Samaritan. So you see there's some variations in the uh, story between the three Gospels, um, but the story is there and the essence of it is there as well too. Though there were three different witnesses probably who uh, uh, witnessed this story and were able to then um, uh, pass it down and get it written down. They heard it a little bit differently, but they got the key elements right, okay? It's an extremely important teaching. It's an extremely important occurrence in the life of Jesus and in the ministry and in the teaching of Jesus. I mean, it's key. The, the, in fact, it sums up Jesus' whole message, okay? The whole message of Christianity, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> And then Jesus asks them a question in reply. Now, I'm going to talk a little more about the second part of this, because that first part, you guys should know, okay? You hear it every week. You know the Shema. You know what it means. So the second part was a little bit harder to me because, you know, I never have quite understood that. Okay, what does that mean? What are we talking about here? Well, let's talk about it a little bit. Jesus asked them this question in reply. Now they're thinking to themselves, huh, this guy answered right. That was pretty good. He did all right. And then in Matthew 22, 42, it says, Jesus answers them. He says, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? They replied, the son of David. Boom, he's got him right there. He got them. Well, why? Why did he get them? That was the trap and he just said it. Well, let's go back a little bit, and we look at the history of Pharisees, okay? The Pharisees actually were a sect that rose out of the uh, time of the Maccabeans and the Maccabean Revolt. They actually became the most pious group in Israel, whereas these Maccabeans kind of became more political and uh, secular in some ways. And one author described those early Pharisees as they started being called as uh, describes their expectation of a personal Messiah, okay, who, as the son of David and king of Israel, will purge Jerusalem of sinners, otherwise known as Romans, uh, Syrians, and Gentiles in general, and then gather together a holy people who will all be the sons of their God. And so this is something of the expectation of the Pharisees as they're looking towards the Messiah. Now, yes, they've seen all of those Old Testament scriptures and prophecies regarding Messiah. But again, they were looking for a son of David to be king of Israel, a military leader. Okay, And so when they answer him in this, they say he is the son of David. And it is true that he is, son of David. He fulfills the prophecy. He is of the lineage of David, okay? The Lion of Judah. They answered correctly from their point of view. The problem was that they didn't expect a son of God, and that's where they get tripped up, okay? And much more importantly, he is the son of God, 
Heath, uh, uh, certainly they did answer correctly in a technical way, you could say son of David, but only the answer son of God would fulfill the Psalm that Jesus quoted, Psalm 110. It's the only way that it's satisfied, okay? So it's, again, from Psalm 110, he said, the Lord said to my Lord, in other words, God the Father said to Jesus, sit at my right hand. And this is the only way that David would call him my Lord, the Messiah, David's Messiah, the Son of God, okay? See, he tripped up the Pharisees because they couldn't answer that question without changing their answer. And from their expectations, Son of God would not even have occurred to them. So once again, on the Pharisees, he confounded them like he did the Sadducees before him. And you know, that question that he asks is so important, the Messiah. Whose son is he? And it's an important question for you to ask as well, and for you to answer. I mean, he is either the son of Joseph of Galilee, a carpenter's son from a little backwater town on the edge of Israel, or he is the son of God. That's the difference that we're talking about. You know, many have asked that question over the years. I mean, in the scripture, it was asked all the time as well, too. Matthew 16, they said, well, uh, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. See, that's why everybody was asking him questions, you know. They, they wanted to know who he was, what he was about. In some places, the gospel says they were trying to decide if he was the Messiah, perhaps. You think he could be the Messiah? I think he might be the Messiah. I don't know. I don't think so. In John chapter 10, it says, the Jews who were gathered around him said, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Do you remember what the answer to that was? He said, I did tell you, but you didn't believe me. <laughs> you see, the question is still relevant. Whose son is he? I mean, what expectations did you have of the Messiah, of the Savior, of the Son of God? Who did you expect him to be? I mean, were you expecting a healer? Were you expecting just a friend in need? Or did you need a comforter? Or maybe it was a provider that you were looking for. Maybe it was a power broker you needed, somebody to make things change. You know, maybe you didn't even know what to expect when you first came to know Jesus. You know, and the thing is, he's all those things that I just mentioned and more. He is the savior of our souls. He is God incarnate. He deserves our obedience. He is master. He is the forgiver of our sins. He is our eternal advocate with the Father. He is a superhero possessing miraculous abilities. And you know what? He's even more than that. You know, the list goes on and on. I can keep going on and on and on and on. Who is Jesus to you? Now, I know that you've answered that question before, and I know that you have an answer to that question. He's probably many things to you, many that I've talked about, you know, and the miraculous thing about it is that he is even more than that. He is more than you can imagine, more than you can, you know, even fathom or comprehend. No matter how long you have served him, no matter how long you've walked with him, no matter what he's brought you through, he still has more, more to offer, more to give you. Now, you know, conversely, if you stop at some point and you say, well, you know, 
um, I'm, I'm, I'm good with you right here. I think this is it. Well, then your discovery of him will stop as well too, at least for a time. If he's your best friend and that's all you want, then that's all he'll be. The Pharisees expected a political power broker, right? They expected a military leader that would free Israel politically, militarily, secularly. And he can do that. And he is that, but not the way they expected. And so they missed the loving, sacrificing son of God. They missed the real superhero there. You see, the point of all this is, is that in the stuff that I researched and came out of this with is, is that you should not limit Jesus, nor I. Don't limit him. Keep expecting new things from him, okay? We've talked for years about keeping up your personal relationship with Jesus. Now, you know you've heard that, that you treat it like a marriage, that you have to keep active, involved in it, you know, uh, stay with him, talk to him daily, throughout your day, you know, include him in your life in many, many different ways that are possible. And one of the reasons to do that is that so that you can experience more and more of his character and his abilities. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, we all go through times where that relationship cools off sometimes. Okay. We go through dry spells. We might go through what they call the dark night of the soul. You know, God doesn't speak to me anymore. My prayers are, you know, not answered. I don't hear him speaking. Uh, my prayers are just blah. And, you know, sometimes that may be because we've stopped expecting anything new from him. And that's why I tell you that it's important to remember that he is bigger than all of your expectations, that he can do more, always. You know, if you think that you've got him figured out, well, then you're headed for the dry spell. <laughs> okay. Yeah, gotta keep searching. That's what it's all about. You know, the Messiah, whose son is he? And what an important question, you know? That is the question, as a matter of fact. What do you expect from him? I told you what the Pharisees expected from him, and they missed it. Has he met your expectations? You know, you had these expectations when you first came to know him. Has he met those? Well, then it's time to come up with new ones. Because he is the son of the living God. <laughs> the son of the living God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much that you have included us in your being. Father, for being a part of the plan of salvation, for being our comforter, for being our friend, for being our healer, for being our advocate, for being our provider. The list can go on and on and on, Lord. In fact, it'll go so far that all we can say is, you are, you are the great I am. I don't mean that the expectations are limitless. And Father, we thank you that you remind us today, even in the midst of difficulties and troubles that we may be having, that you're bigger than all of those things. You're bigger than any of the uh, anxieties, the worries that we have, and that you are in us with that incredible bigness that you had. Father, I pray that you would remind each of us that as we go through our difficulties and the trials that we're facing, you're not surprised. You are not thrown off guard. You are there with us through it all. So Father, minister to us now, we pray. And Lord, as we ask the Messiah, whose son is he? Show us something new. In Jesus' name, amen.